loud. All right, we're recording now. Uh, okay, let me introduce uh, uh, Rob uh, to you first. You've probably read some of the flyer um, about uh, Rob's uh, qualifications for this, uh, but let me highlight a few other things. Robert Whiting is a native of Washington, D.C. He graduated magna cum laude from the University of the District of Columbia with a degree in business administration and received an MBA with a concentration in finance, uh, finance and investments from George Washington University. Mr. Whiting worked most of his career in the federal government in a number of agencies, such as the General Accounting Office, Treasury Department, IRS, and somebody else who wants to be admitted. Uh, he rose to the rank of senior executive and retired from the federal government in 2001. After Mr. Whiting retired from the federal government, he was hired in the private sector, becoming a vice president. He resigned from that position in January 2005. He has done over 40 years of research on Africa, particularly Nile Valley civilizations. Mr. Whiting studied the Meru Netcher, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, under the tutelage of Ankh Mira, the only African-American to write a grammar book on this ancient African language. He has sat at the feet of some of the world's most preeminent African scholars and went on, a went on a study tour to Kemet, which we call Egypt today, with Dr. Charles Finch an internationally renowned Nile Valley civilization scholar and lecturer. Mr. Whiting has lectured in a variety of settings, including universities, schools, churches, and community groups up and down the East Coast and in Africa. So without further ado, let me turn this over to Robert Whiting. Uh, thank you, Ryan Ho, for that um, uh, very nice introduction. Oftentimes when I hear it, I'm, I'm wondering who you're talking about, but um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be with all of you uh, this evening. Um, we are, we're going to uh, take a journey that hopefully, if you are able to uh, participate in the three sessions uh, for uh, ending in November, that uh, you will have a completely different perspective on the world and on yourself. And that is the idea for these uh, Zoom sessions. Because there's so much information that uh, is not disseminated and is not taught. And especially when it comes to Africa. And so uh, also I'd like to put a plug in for an organization that I've uh, been a member of for the last 17 years because we joined the African American Culture Society prior to us moving here. And uh, the, the thrust of what it does in terms of uh, promoting and conveying information uh, regarding Africa and the As uh, African diaspora uh, to the citizens of Flagler and uh, the world for those of our, uh, those uh, who tune in. Uh, it's a great organization. And I would encourage uh, those of you who are not members uh, to consider joining. Uh, you can go to Facebook and type in African American Culture Society and it will give you all the information as to how you can join. It's a, it's a wonderful organization. You will get newsletters and uh, quite a bit of information about uh, Africa and what is going on in America. Now, I would like to start with what I call a circle of knowledge. And uh, all of us have a knowledge base based on our experiences, based on where we were reared, based on who our parents were, um, or what type of um, uh, environment we came up in, whether it was the city or the rural areas. Uh, and all of those um, 
experiences help shape and mold our minds. Um, one of the things that we have to really work on when we have this circle of knowledge is to be aware of it so that whenever we hear or are exposed to information that's outside of our circle of knowledge that we don't immediately reject it. Okay, that's something that we have to really be aware of because just because we are like 60 or 70 years old and maybe we are exposed to information that we've never heard before it does not necessarily mean that there can't be some validity to it. So we have to keep an open mind. However, and oftentimes, what we experience is what we call cognitive dissonance when we hear or expose the information that's outside of our circle of knowledge. Because sometimes these beliefs that we have or the things that we experience are such that when we hear something that's different, the natural tendency is to not to feel comfortable. And that is a natural response for most humans. In fact, it's one of the ways that the uh, people in control oftentimes are able to exert influence on populations because they know that if they hear information that is uh, out of the people's realm of experience, oftentimes they will have this discomfort and they will basically ignore it or basically uh, shoot the messenger, if you will. So we have to really keep that in mind. Now, another very important uh, aspect of life is history. In fact, history is probably one of the most important aspects of life in terms of ensuring that people are able to understand what time of day it is in terms of their lives. Because history is like a compass. And that is why everywhere we go, no matter which country it is, there are always museums. The streets are named after certain personalities or certain places within that country. So everything that you see, the buildings, the streets, et cetera, are all part of that history. And history is so important that it's, it is similar to the relationship between a mother and her child. Because there's like this, this bond and without knowledge of one's history, then a person is off center no matter how smart they are or how accomplished they are because they are missing a key link in terms of the history grounding them and, and, and being uh, a, um, a, a focal point in terms of where they are. So it's extremely important. And especially for uh, African and African American um, peoples, oftentimes we go into school systems and the focus is more on, on, on other types of history, such as here in America, the focus is primarily on European history and American history. And we may get a small taste of, of, of African or African American history, but it's not enough to ground us so that we can understand where we are on the clock of time. And as a result of that, oftentimes, it can cause uh, low self-esteem or insecurities because everyone else is grounded in their history and they're proud of their history. And oftentimes the way um, black history and African history is taught, it doesn't give one a, uh, something to be proud of, okay? And so as a result of that, by not being grounded in, in the history and having a common sheet of music to sing from, people are all over the place. That's why oftentimes it's very difficult for people who don't have a common history to come together and uh, rally around certain issues or to move forward without even having a meeting. Because the history and the culture is one that will direct people in a certain direction. 
I mean, for example, we've seen other ethnicities, for example, come into America. You never see them on TV. You never see uh, or hear about any meetings, but all of a sudden, this particular ethnic group, ethnic group has a lot of the motels or buy up all of the motels across America. Or they may start buying, getting into hair products, but you never hear anybody debating whether or not they're gonna do that. It just happens. And I submit that part of the reason for that uh, happening is because they have a history and they have a culture that they can rally around. And so they move together whenever they understand that it's for their best interest. Okay, that's one of the reasons that we have the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's there to basically bring back our memory and to restore our memories about what has happened over the last 500 years. And it's, it's extremely important. But we must keep in mind that African people have been here for over 200,000 years. So this is important for the last 500 years, but we can't leave out 199,000 to 500 years just to focus on solely on 500 years. And that 500 years was when African people are, were at their lowest point. When we were snatched from the shores of Africa, we were conquered first by the Arabs and then by Europeans, okay? And so we must keep it in perspective that it's important, but it's just a very, very small slice of our, of our history. And therefore we must also learn the larger part of our history, which will basically help us to put what has happened to um, African and, and uh, African American in perspective. And uh, it's really interesting that the Washington Monument is to the right of this museum. And uh, it's, it's, this is one of the most important uh, African symbols in the world. And I'm gonna get into that later on. It is it's very, very significant. That's why you see it everywhere you go. No matter where you go in the world, you will see a, a, a tekkenu. Uh, the Greeks renamed the obelisk. And by the way, I will not use uh, names that are not indigenous to Africa because what happens when I say Tekken, that has a historical um, uh, foundation. And if you look up the word Tekken, then you can go and find out what this structure really means versus as if I said obelisk, that takes away the meaning of it. Okay. And, and getting to back to how important it is, um, Tony Browder, who was a noted historian out of Washington, D.C., and said, uh, to not know what happened before your ancestors were slave is to always remain a slave. Okay, because if all you are taught is what happened when you were at your lowest point, then it, it, it impacts uh, an individual uh, psychologically where they can't really, uh, they don't have the ability to see the greatness or the potentiality of, of the future. Um, I, I want to uh, start this off in terms of a, a, a person who's had a tremendous impact on our understanding of what was lost. His name is Gerald Massey. Uh, Gerald Massey uh, uh, was born and reared in England. And uh, he was a, a genius. I mean, Gerald Massey was a, a, a poet, a Shakespearean scholar. He, had, he, he was a master in mythology. He was an Egyptologist. And he spent over 36 years just studying ancient Kemet, or what we now call um, Egypt. Again, I'm not, I'll just use Egypt as a reference. Because when you look at the name Kemet Nu, what that means in the Meta Nature is the land of the Black people. Now, what you will run up on if you do research is that you will have some of the Egyptologists that will try to make the claim that 
they were referring to the black soil, soil. Okay, but then you have to ask yourself the question, what people name their country after the soil? You know, uh, the Greeks named their country, you know, after Greece, okay? The Romans named their country after Roman. I mean, on and on and on. So just keep that in mind. But in, in, in one of his uh, last works, and uh, he spent 10 years in the British Museum writing his first book. 10 years of research in the British Museum. Um, but his last work was Egypt Light of the World. And this is what he says at the beginning of this, of this book. And I think it's so prevalent. It may have been a million years ago, the land was kindled in the old dark land from which the illuminated scrolls are all aglow that Egypt gave us with her mummied hand. This was the smile of that subtle secret of that sm subtle smile inscrutable upon this sphinx face. Now told from sea to sea, from isle to isle, the revelation of the old dark race. Theirs was the wisdom of the bee and bird, honey, tortoise, beaver, and working human wise. The ancient doctrines spiked with Egypt's word. Hers was the primal message of the skies. The heavens are telling nightly of her glory, and for all time, earth echoes her great story. And there's a lot to this. And as we go along, you're gonna, it's gonna unfold, and you will see exactly what he's talking about. Because ancient Africans wrote their story in the sky. It can't be destroyed. The trick is to understand and be able to read it. Now, here's a, a, a photo of Gerald Massey. And thanks to Gerald Massey, after the um, temples were closed by um, Emperor Justina, um, everything was shut down. The meta uh was banned. The language was basically lost. No one knew how to read uh, the meta -Nature. Okay. Gerald Massey, after going into, going to Egypt and spending 36 years, uh, understood that Egypt was the light of the world. That the thousands and thousands of years that it took for man to evolve and to learn the secrets of nature, which is science, um, happened in Africa, and Africa laid the foundation for the civilization of the rest of the world. Okay? And this was lost until he wrote his last masterpiece, which was Egypt, Light of the World. So for up until the 1800s, all of this information was lost about what ancient Africans had done. So Gerald Massey, thanks to him and his impeccable research, was able to go back and do research and reclaim that history and talk about it. Of course, initially it was rejected. Uh, he was ostracized, um, oftentimes, people would say, well, we can't understand what he's talking about. But he laid the foundation for the rest of the scholars to build upon. So he is really key in terms of, of going back and resurrecting this lost knowledge. Okay, now, before we can even talk about um, present day history, in order to give us a grounding, we must talk about evolution and the beginning of man. And what I will focus on is science. I'm not, you know, this is strictly science that I'm talking about. I know um, many of you may have beliefs, or may have been exposed to different ideas, but I am basing everything that I talk about in science. And we know now that uh, man evolved we have all of the evidence, we have the skeletal remains, um, and we know that the only place that we have found 
all of the stages of man has been in Africa. Um, that is a fact. Uh, we can trace the DNA back to Africa. And so here we have some of the first four stages of the Homo series. Uh, this is when the evolution was moving us closer and closer to what we call modern man. Okay, and here we have the Orthopithecus, which was basically uh, not considered in the Homo series. Okay, and so, but he evolved, he evolved and got the Homo uh, habilis, Homo erectus, and of course we had the, the Neanderthals. And we know from the research that has happened in, in Europe that when Homo sapiens sapiens, modern man, started going into Europe, that there was some mating with the uh, Neanderthals because they've been able to trace uh, some of this Neanderthal DNA to the present population of, of um, some of the people in, in Europe. Um, I want to talk about Homo, Homo nalili, which was a recent discovery and it shocked the scientific community because even though this was a pre-human, Homo nalili had uh, developed the wherewithal to bury their dead in a, a certain location and what was more astonishing was the bodies were facing in this in a certain direction so they had developed a ritual and even though they weren't hadn't gotten to the point of homo sapiens sapiens which basically is saying that that's when man began to reason through their instinct or their understanding of what was going on they understood the importance of a burial and and they developed a ritual in terms of of, of the burial sites. And we found that this, a cave down in, uh, in uh, South Africa uh, where a large number of them were buried. Okay, the human journey. As I said, um, it started around 200, even though the latest findings are, are pushing that back to 300,000 years, but we know without question that the beginning of humanity was down here in Southern Africa, okay? Um, and that Africans were on the planet by themselves for the first 140,000 years. They didn't even leave Africa because they almost didn't survive as a result of the last glaciation, the ice age, the air became so dry that it was hard for them to survive even in Africa. And um, they dwindled down to a small number of humans. But as the ice age receded, they were able to um, uh, survive and to multiply. And what happened approximately 60,000 years ago, they started leaving Africa, okay? And so we have to remember now there are parts of Africa here near uh, Djibouti and the Persian Gulf. You can see the Persian Gulf from Africa. It's the same thing here up in Morocco and Spain. On a clear day, you can see, you can see Europe. So the seas were about 300 feet less deep. So we got to keep that in mind because they were able to it maybe even walk across these, these the water barriers and with, because the, the water was 300 feet less deep. And so they crossed and they went into the Pers uh, Persian Gulf about 50,000 years ago. And about the same, so they spent time down here in Australia, they got down here around 50,000 years ago. So this entire population was all African. And they went up here into Central Asia and eventually over into uh, uh, Europe, what we call Europe. Now, keep in mind that these were Africans. And also keep in mind that these Africans who evolved down here in the southern part of Africa were not 
real dark skin. They were brown skin because they, were, they didn't have any need to uh, have real dark skin to survive. The reason that the Africans near the equator have a real dark, like in Sudan and Nubia, is because of the fact that they're on the equator and that's the only way that they could have survived uh, when they were when they were uh, living, didn't have uh, a lot of, didn't have homes, didn't have clothes and that type of thing. So they their skin was the protection and the only way they could survive was to be really, really dark. Now, the first and the oldest humans are the Twa, or the Kusan people. What you're looking at, if we're talking about a scientific Adam and Eve, that's, these are the people. They are the oldest Homo sapiens sapiens on the planet. And we know that because scientists have been um, taking DNA samples from people all over the world. And these people have the oldest dispersion of DNA than any other group in the world, and that includes any other group in Africa. So all human beings sprung from these people. And that's why when we hear terms such as the black race, the white race, uh, the Asian race, um, et cetera, it's really not true. There's only one race and that's the human race. All these other groups, they're ethnic groups. You have people who were, uh, um, reared in the continent of what we call Asia, but there are different ethnicities on that continent. The same thing with Europe. But we all had the same mother. Every human being had an original mother who looked similar to this lady here. And that is a scientific fact. Now, some of you may feel <clears throat> a little uncomfortable when I say that, especially uh, my brothers and sisters who are classified as white. But the, scientific, the science shows and proves, and it's irrefutable, that everyone's original mother looks similar to this lady right here. She is the Mitochondrian um, E, if you will. And we know that for, for a fact because the mitochondrial DNA is passed from mother to mother intact. And as a result, we can trace it all the way back to the original source. And here's some more of the Kusan of Troyes. And this is where they were primarily uh, live during ancient time down here in southern Africa. That's why they're not real dark skin, they're, they're brown skin, okay, because they were further away from the equator. And to prove my point about um, all of the other populations all over the world being African, here we have some Aborigines, here we have a young man with blonde hair, here we have a Chinese terrier called a, so a soldier. Okay, we have the original Buddhas. That's why you see the peppercorn hair even today, even though the features may have changed. They're more Asian. Um, but the original Buddha was, was African and they, they changed. Here we have China in the Quinn Dynasty. And it, it, I was reading this research paper by a Chinese scientist and his, his whole goal was to prove that that Chinese had evolved from a separate branch of the human family. And so he went about the business of, of, of trying to prove that. Well, after a number of years of research and with the advent of DNA and being able to uh, trace the DNA back through uh, uh, millennium, he had to come to the realization that the original Chinese were Africans. 
And here's a, a photo of some of those uh, original uh, Chinese. Uh, and it's really interesting. Very seldom, if ever, will you see uh, these photos of these people on CNN, you know, any of the news sources or, or anything. Um, here's a photo of some Chinese since 1869. Okay. 1869. Okay. 1902. These Chinese were fighting against uh, the powers to be, and they were rounded up and executed because they were trying to maintain their freedom. Here we have Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia. Um, I went on a trip with, uh, in fact, a number of you uh, on this Zoom conference uh, to Asia. And when we were in Vietnam, I took a side trip to Hope Mountain. And the reason I took the side trip is because these people had developed temples there. The first people to inhabit Southeast Asia were African people. And they ruled for thousands of years until they were run out. And they had statues and they had a language that we still haven't been able to decipher. And that's why when I was in the military and stationed at Fort Bragg, my buddies who had gone to Vietnam and come back told me, Robert, the women in Cambodia are just like sisters, <laughs> okay? Because this is what they were seeing. They say, wow, it's just like American women, you know? And um, so these were the first people to inhabit uh, what we call Southeast Asia, okay? And let's go to Europe. The oldest figurine or any uh, portrait of a, a human that we've found in, in Europe is the Venus of Wittendorf. It's about 32,000 years old. It was found uh, near Vienna, and it's that of an African woman. Okay, so we know that 32,000 years ago, and they can carbon date this because there was wood around it, so they, they can basically determine the age, uh, that this, this was done around 32,000 years ago, and that there were African people in Europe. Here we found um, a hunter who had blue eyes but dark skin, all right? And then we had the Cheddar Man. Okay, this, is, this was an astonishing find because, again, he has blue eyes, but he's a dark brown skinned man, and basically it's... Um, this was like uh, 30 some thousand years ago. So this is what some of the people in, in Europe look like. Okay, all right. But as it, as, as it got colder and colder, they had, they had to lose this melanin because they couldn't survive uh, with a lot of melanin. Because when, when the sun would come out uh, during uh, the latter part of the ice age, um, it would only come out for maybe a month during, uh, uh, during the year. So their skin had to become lighter in order to absorb the vitamin D. Otherwise they would get uh, rickets and die. So, so they had to become lighter. There was just no way they could have survived without becoming lighter. And so that's why we have uh, humans that we classify now as white. The reason they are, they are light skinned is because of the fact that their ancestors uh, had to become light because of the cold weather and the lack of, of sunlight. Now, this is um, astonishing that we've been able to uh, confirm, and this is uh, the second case that I know of, of a married couple from Africa having a white baby, okay? Uh, now, this is baby is with the blonde hair, um, and they did the DNA test because I know you've heard the old adage, mama's baby, daddy's maybe, okay? So I'm sure when the mother and father saw this baby, they were like, well, how could this happen? Well, they did the DNA test, and this is his 
he's the father and she's the mother. They don't know how this ha happened. Uh, it happened very, very rarely. This was probably the second or third case, but it has only happened from people who were reared and born in Africa. It's never happened with African Americans or anyone uh, in the diaspora. Oh, and, and, and this um, child is not an albino. It is considered a, uh, what we would classify as a, as a white uh, a human. Okay, now we have to keep in mind that once we separated from animal, we still had a lot of the things that allow animals to survive intuition and instinct. Okay, birds fly because of instinct, they do certain things because of instinct, and, and the animal kingdom operates on instinct. So as we were coming out of that animal state, we maintain some of that, that instinct. And that's how it allowed us to survive. And as we began to, our brains began to develop and we began to think, we began to unwind some of the complexities of nature. And again, remember what I said about nature. Nature is basically what I could say in a nutshell, and I will talk about this later in other sessions, is basically God's word. Because if God made the universe and is responsible for all of the things in the cosmos, then, then science is just an understanding of nature. The more we understand about nature, the more advancements we make in science. But anyhow, these early humans, uh, they started trying to make sense of what they were seeing. And they were trying to, trying to make sense of surviving because they had the animals and they were living uh, in various places. So they had to find ways to survive and their brain and their thinking capacity allowed them to survive and basically outthink the predators and, and the other dangers. And what we have found, and this is part of Gerald Massey's uh, uh, work, that the tendency of the human mind is to conceive all other beings with the same features. Okay. That's why, and we see it even up to date. If we look at um, uh, the uh, Superman, you know, here we have a Superman who can fly and has this tremendous amount of strength, but we picture him as a human or Batman, or the fly. When we look at all of these heroes, we humanize them, but we give them the powers of some um, animal or insect. And so this is what ancient man did. Basically, when he looked at these powers that he didn't have, um, he basically ascribed them uh, to him, him uh, similar to himself, but they join with this particular power. Okay, so they, they associate these power when they saw eight, for example. That's why as we get further into the other sessions, that's why they had um, uh, a certain heads on, on some of the uh, personalities in Kemet. For example, you may see um, uh, a hawk head on a human being. Okay, or you may see a, a, uh, a, a, a some type of bird head on a human being. Because what they, were, what they were seeing and telling us is that the power of that particular animal or insect was embedded in that, in that uh, human body. And the storyline or the mythology was based on the powers of that particular um, uh, human with, with the animal um, potentiality. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of the sound, sign language, it was a primitive mode of expression in terms of, I said, in, in intuition and instinct. And initially, man did not understand 
that he had any role in the birth of a child. I mean, we got to understand that ancient man try to go back. And sure, it was natural for men and women to have sexual relationships, but the man initially did not have an understanding that he had anything to do with birth. And so when women uh, would uh, have their menstrual cycle every month, and then they would uh, be, uh, have uh, uh, our humans, our birth of the humans, ancient man put her on a pedestal because she had powers that he didn't have. And he didn't understand initially that he had anything to do with the birth of another human. Okay, but as man began to realize he contributed to the birth of another human, then he started changing his perception of the role of the women. But initially, that's why women, that's why you find in Africa, you have a matriarchal uh, uh, a society in ancient Africa and in other cultures too, that the woman played a primary role in that society because this was out of the respect of the special power that she had and the, and the role that she played in maintaining that, that society. And ancient man didn't, didn't create gods in his own image. He basically took the powers, like I said, of the apes and the hippopotamus and the crocodiles, lions, et cetera, and attached them to the human body. Now, as man advanced and began to get into agriculture, which allowed uh, him to settle in one place and develop communities, uh, nature taught them that they could find the answers in nature in terms of answering their questions. And so they began to understand that as they understood the, the nature of watched animals and watched their behaviors, not only did it allow them to survive, but it also gave them information about uh, nature. And so they began to understand that there was a relationship between what was happening on earth and, and, the, and the heavens, okay? In terms of the, the cycles of nature and which basically was the beginning of mathematics and science. Now, over thousands and thousands of years, they were accumulating this knowledge. You had what we call stargazers. Those were people who their, their sole job was at night to watch the heavens and track, and track the heavenly bodies. And they began to understand certain cycles, certain patterns, and they began to uh, be able to plant and harvest based on uh, cycles and those patterns. But all of this came out of you know, Kenya, Ethiopia, as they were moving up and following the Nile. And this was in thousands and thousands of years because they were walking. Um, and uh, so some Africa, these parts of Africa basically were the brain, they pulled together all of the information, the culture, in order for what we call Egypt or Kemet to become the first greatest civilization known to man. All right, now, in the Neolithic period, which is when they were coming out of this uh, stage of where they were starting to use modern tools and starting to make advancements in architecture, it was between 18,000 and, and, and 17,000 years ago. So again, I have to keep emphasizing this because this is the only way that we can understand how Africans were able to do what they did in, uh, later on in Africa because we got to look at this time frame. They had hundreds of thousands of years to understand nature and to unlock the secrets of, of nature. And there was a, a period between where they was, it had superstition, belief, belief in faith, and faith in science, and knowledge of the divine, which is basically knowledge of nature. This is extremely important. And so they observed the life cycle of plants 
and they begin to understand that Alma, that the life cycles were basically the same. There was a conception stage, birth, growth, aging, death, decay, and resurrection. In other words, plants went through a, a, a birth, and you put a seed in the ground, it would grow, then it would age, either you harvest it or it would age and it would die, it would decay, and then it would resurrect itself, it would come back again. So they begin to notice the similarities between the plants, the animal, and, the, and, and humans, that this life cycle was the same for all of the entities that they saw and what they experienced. And, and, it, and they also begin to realize, in addition to understanding agriculture better and looking at these cycles and understanding that the plant, animal, and human uh, existence was basically the same a cycle, they began to see these patterns of the moon. First, they started off with a, a, a lunar calendar, which is very obvious because, you know, you can't miss the moon. And they realized that, you know, it went through its phases for about 29 days, and then it would restart again. Then they moved to the stellar calendar, and then the, then the, the, the solar calendar. And over time, and this is extremely important, they began to realize that there was a, a great year. This was the, this was the cycle of 25,920 years. We call it the procession of the equinox. In other words, the polar stars circumvented, uh, the stars circumvented the, the, the polar star, and it took them 25,920 uh, 20 years to make a complete circle. And so the polar stars move in a degree about every 72 years. So if you multiply 72 times 360, you'll get 25,920 years. And they also figured out that there was an age because once they begin to understand and map the heavens and, and the, uh, the planets, they realized that each one of the um, zodiac signs stayed in, a, in, in position for 2,160 years. And that was because of the, the spring equinox. So right now we are in the age of Pisces and we are moving out of the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. So Pisces is the star that is on the horizon whenever we have a spring equinox. Okay, and that's on um, March the 21st of every year. And it will stay, Pisces will stay in that position for 2,160 years approximately. Then there will be a retrograde motion. Then we'll move into the age of Aquarius. That's why we've had songs, the age of Aquarius. And by moving into a, another uh, zodiac sign, it is supposed to have an impact on humans on the planet in terms of our behavior. And it's no coincidence from where I sit why women, women are coming into the fold, all right? Because the age of Aquarius is when women are supposed to basically come and, and, and basically be a major force uh, on the planet. Now, of course, they then eventually figured out the 365 and a quarter day and that was uh, pretty obvious for the Africans on the Nile because they were in a perfect spot because every year, whenever they saw the sun and the constellation of Orion come up together, that was their, that was their uh, new year. And that, that occurred um, uh, on the 21st, of um, let's see, um, hang on, April, May, June, of June, every year. All right, and so the Africans started their new year uh, the 21st of June, and they had a festival for 14 days. And I'm gonna get into this later, so it's no coincidence 
that we have our 4th of July uh, 13 days after June the 21st, all right? That, that, that's not a coincidence. Where well, the birth of this nation basically occurred on, on July the 4th. But the Africans' New Year started January, I mean, uh, June the 21st. Once they began to understand these cycles and see the similarities between animal, plant, and human life, they began to uh, understand some of the secrets of nature. And this was uh, the reason for some of their growth and their ability to start making tools and start using those tools to um, harness nature. Okay, once we look at um, the man's sperm, which, for example, is, is implanted in a woman's body, they looked at it as, as similar to planting a seed in the ground. Okay? Because the same process of gestation takes place. And that was revolutionary in terms of them beginning to understand that because they, in, on top of that, they begin to understand the vibrations and the patterns and, and they begin to understand the frequency of what was occurring. It takes nine months for a child to be born. Okay, that, uh, that the moon is basically, uh, a life cycle is about 29 days. And that led to a high order of thinking skills and consciousness. And it was the beginning of mathematics. And we know that the beginning of mathematics has something to do with the menstrual cycle and the moon. Because here we have the, the bombo bone. This is the oldest um, evidence of mathematics in the world. It has 29 markings on it. And we know that it dealt with um, the phases of the moon and maybe the menstrual cycle. But the point is that ancient man was able to make these 29 marks that was the first evidence in the world of, of humans counting. And this was very, very, this was very, very important. Okay. Okay. And it is, the reason it's called the bumbo bone is because it's in a place called the Bumble down in South Africa. And so this, this was critical in terms of, of um, our ancient ancestors beginning to understand and looking at the moon and maybe looking at us at, at a woman's uh, a, a menstrual cycle as important in, in marking that. Okay, and this bone is around um, 30, 2,000 years old, between 32,000 and 40,000 years old. So ancient man started counting around 35,000 years ago. And then we have more proof. This is the Shango bone. Now this was, this is probably, uh, some historians are saying it's the greatest find in the history of man. All right, and uh, it's housed in the Royal Museum of, or Museum of Science, in fact, when Harriet and I were in Europe, we took a special trip to Brussels because I wanted to see this bone for myself. It's about 20,000 years old, and it is the oldest evidence of advanced mathematics in the world. On this bone, we have the use of prime numbers, which is any number that can be divided by itself uh, and, and, and one. So numbers such as one, three, five, but on this particular bone, we had the prime numbers between 10 and 20. Okay, 13, 17, and 19. Okay, these numbers, these are the prime numbers and 11 between uh, 10 and 20. So these Africans had to have had an understanding of prime numbers and 
prime numbers are the basis for all of the security that we deal with today on the internet is based on prime numbers. The reason that they're able to come up with these um, codes that no one can break is because they use prime numbers. Okay, this is the first evidence of the use of one, of addition, multiplication, and, and the use of duality, which is the use of one and two, which we now use for our computers. So this is Sean Obone was the first evidence we had of advanced mathematics. And it was in a place called Ashango, again, in, in the southern part of Africa. It's, it, uh, it's, it's, it's astonishing. What I didn't know when I, before I got to the Royal Museum of Science in Brussels, that it was, it's the major attraction in this Museum of Science where they have the dinosaurs, where they have all of this, the science, and the scientists around the world have concluded that this was the, that they would make this the most prominent exhibit in the Museum of Science. That tells you how important this bone is, okay? Again, this is just more evidence about the role that Africans have played in laying the foundation for the civilization of the world. Okay, and I've talked about uh, this. Let's get into the calendars. I did talk about the moon and the stellar calendar and, and the repetition in the circles, uh, circles of time. And they basically were able to uh, derive this because in, in especially in Kemet, it, it only rains three or four inches a year. So they had clear skies every night where they could map out the, uh, the, the, the travels of the stars and the planets and they could see them every night because it didn't rain that often. All right, and, and they, were, they were modern, uh, ancient man was using the uh, stellar calendar about 10,000 years ago. We know that we have seen evidence of a stellar calendar 10,000 years ago. Um, they understood too, as they moved from the moon to the stellar calendar, then to uh, the solar calendar, that the sun was the source of all life. And that if the sun did not come up, then life would cease to exist. So they began to really observe the sun and look at the influence of the sun on human beings. And here we have in, the, in Ethiopia, uh, this is uh, the monoliths where they were mapping out and pointing to certain stars that, that would show up around, around a certain time of the year. So here we have evidence and we have some of this in Stonehenge also in Europe. We have, we have Stonehenge, which is basically pointing to certain uh, stars uh, certain times of year. And then we have Neva Plyer. Now this is astonishing because here in, uh, in Neva Plyer, we, also, we have the earliest archeological site in the world in terms of actually, we have the proof that they were citing the constellation of Orion. And this was around 10,000 years ago. It basically was just astonishing when they realized what this really meant. And here we are. If we look at the constellation of Orion, there's a certain time of year when this complex is coming up that these megaliths line up with the constellation of Orion. So we know that it, the intent of this was to track uh, this constellation and when it appeared. Now, as a result of that understanding, ancient man also began to realize that there was a, a yin and yang in the universe, that everything had to have 
another opposite. And that is why we exist. And if we understand that, it will better help us to live in peace and harmony. And what do I mean by that? Our lives are based on a ream of separation. We can't have night unless we have day. Okay, in order for us to have, a, a, we can't have a human unless we have a male and female. If you have happiness, then there has to be sadness. It's impossible to be happy all the time. Okay, it's impossible to be good all the time. If you have up, you can't have up unless you have down. In order to have health, you have to have sickness. And I'm a musician. I can't play music unless I play both harmony and dissonance. It's just a, a matter of how I mix those two. And if one is a mathematician, you can't have math unless you have odd and even numbers. Without one, the other one cannot exist. So the whole world that we're in is based on this separation. And one of the goals and one of the challenges for us as humans is to understand that and not get too hung up on when good things happen that we're just all elated and we're so happy and the whole bit. And, and basically when things don't go our way, then we are down in the dumps. The, the secret of life is to try to stay in the middle so that no matter what happens that causes happiness, you appreciate it, but you don't get off the scale in terms of happiness and you don't go to other uh, end when, when bad things happen to you. So no matter what's going on, the, 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 the secret in terms of trying to maintain a consistent state of being where you are, you are, are not pulled either from a, a lot of happiness or a lot of sadness is to stay in the middle. Okay. So, and, and to further elaborate on that, you know, we have happiness, but happiness can't exist without sadness. And so they both depend on each other. Okay. And oftentimes our happiness is based on what we get in life. We want something, we get it, we're happy. I, I can remember when I got my first car. Oh, I was so happy. I mean, I was just, you know, oh, I could ride and I could do things, go places. But after a while, the car just, you know, it was the happiness wore off. It was just something that I used for transportation because it was artificial and it's unsustainable and it's temporary. All right. Also, when we get into the state of, of um, going to extremes, we have a tendency to want to judge. So if something bad happens to us, we're trying to judge that. If something ha good happens to us, we're trying to judge that. Or we are trying to determine what's good and bad. And we're looking at the world through what we perceive as good and bad. Okay, and what that does, it, it takes us, we're jerked around. So again, the, the trick is to try to be free from these opposite conditions. And when you think about it, when we talk about heaven, what is heaven? The heaven is being free from, from the opposites, right? The whole idea of heaven is being paradise and to be happy forever, that you experience no pain, that you experience no sadness, that you experience no tragedy, that you experience no disappointment. So what we are saying is that this paradise that we envision is outside of the realm of our existence here on this planet. So it's a part of the greater whole. So this reality that we are living in is, is basically uh, is similar to a coin. 
Okay, so when we see yin and yang, that's basically what we are talking about, is that we want to be free from these opposing conditions. We can't have, and that'll be about as close as we can have heaven here on earth. We're still going to encounter that, but we don't get jerked around from, uh, uh, from these extremes. And I've been working on this all my life. Okay, I know it. It's very difficult to do, uh, to keep from the, the highs and the lows, to try to stay in the middle. Uh, sometimes it might make you what we would consider a party pooper, okay? <laughs> okay, all right. Now, in terms of our values that we impose on the world, when, we, when I say up and down, that's just something that we've come up with. Is that a reality? I don't know. You know, east, west, north, south, that's what we call it. Is that, that's our reality, but it's just something that we've come up with. Miles and, and, and kilometers. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a way for us to track distance, but it's something that we've come up with, okay, that we all agree upon. Now, I've talked a lot, a lot about the beginning of humanity and how that transpired, and also the importance of understanding that we live in a ream of duality. And I also spoke about one of the best ways to maintain harmony in that ream of duality is to try to stay in the middle. And so I want to close with this um, slide of the Black Panther, uh, bless his soul, and the fact that when he does this, it's nothing new. It goes back thousands and thousands of years. And basically we see it in the Aztec culture. Of course, we see it in Africa. You know, we see it in, 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 the, in South America um, and some aspects of North America. And with that, that ends Zoom session one. And I think Ryan Ho uh, wants you to break out into, into groups. Pardon? Oh, okay. Ryan right. Ho, can you come back on? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let's go to uh, breakout sessions and spend about 10 minutes to uh, say hello and greet and uh, share whatever you've gotten out of uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, we're now 31 people here, so let's say we're going to go to about seven rooms. Okay. Okay, you got to hit join, right? Introduce yourself and share.
in it here. Sonia White. Um, Ms. White, did you get an invitation to a breakout room? Yes, I did. Okay, just click on that and you'll join people. There you go. Mary, did you get an invitation to a breakout room? Just go ahead and click on that and then unmute so you can talk to people. And now, is this breakout room one? I have no idea. Let me take a look. <laughs> well, I went to breakout room one and I was the only one there. And I talked there for a few minutes, nobody responded, so I came back to the main room. You're right, nobody has uh, joined anybody in breakout room one. It was you, Ralph Lightfoot, and uh, somebody called A-H-E-C-C-P-C. -C -C. <laughs> I have no idea who that is. Are we, am, I, am I supposed to go to that room again? How do I do that? No, uh, just stick around here. So what okay. do you think? What's okay. your impression? All right. What was your impression of Rod's uh, presentation? Excellent, very good. Uh, it, uh, I remember seeing a f one time in a training class when I was working about color and the reasons we all have different colors of skin. Yeah. And it basically talked about the same thing he described and that was the migration of people from different parts of the world and the environment that the world had on people. So they adjusted the skin color to survive. Right. Uh, uh, Europeans need more uh, vitamin D because the sun doesn't shine enough. So you've got to have, uh, uh, you know, paler skin in order to take in uh, sufficient uh, vitamin D. Absolutely. Uh, Ralph, Absolutely. go ahead and uh, uh, unmute. Uh, I know you're there. You probably can hear us, right? And C's iPad. I have no idea who that is, but uh, feel free to... Uh, unmute and uh, speak to us. And uh, Dr. Ayoka Jay-Z Sowala is here also, but she is muted. There she Hi. is. Hey. <laughs> is Somebody it? spoke, but I'm that sorry. was not her. This is the best part. Yeah, go, go ahead and uh, turn on your camera, so maybe we oh, can. Oh, I'm not decent. Jay-Z, <laughs> leave it off by all means. <laughs> Well, she, she remembered. <laughs> <laughs> what I was really intrigued by is that, uh, Ply, what was it, Playa Napta? You know, the stone circle? Oh, yeah. Uh, because look at the difference. Uh, Stonehenge was built in about 3000 BCE. And uh, Playa Napta was built in 10,000 BCE. So I think there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that uh, came from Africa to the rest of the world. Uh, I think he's right on target. And unfortunately, the only one we've ever heard of was Stonehenge. Right, right, because it's a tourist attraction. Somebody's making money off it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think colonial, colonialism has a lot to do with that too, because the colonial powers did not admit that there were huge cities in South Africa, for instance, because they couldn't, they, they couldn't allow themselves to think that Africans had actually built that. You know, uh, the- uh, They tried to say Africans didn't build the pyramids. I mean, they tried to come up with, say aliens did it. <laughs> <laughs> so they believed that easily, more easily. You're right. <clears throat> Oh, there's some more, more folks. Hey, Mel. Yeah, go feel free to unmute. We're just hanging out because some people didn't find their various meeting rooms. So, 
So this is recorded, right? Yeah, it's being recorded. Right? You want to take a look at uh, this, this presentation? Was recorded also. I would assume we're trying to. I'm being. <laughs> we're trying to figure out what we should need to do. Do wrong. We did do wrong. Rado, you're getting a lot of feedback. I'm sorry? There's a lot of feedback when you speak. Yeah, I think microphones are a little bit sensitive. But what they do is that, um, that like, Mel, I think you picks up the sound of my voice and uh, echoes it back. All right, well, I'm going to bounce out. I've been up early this morning and I need to get some rest to be up again early tomorrow morning. It was very interesting and I'll be back for the next one. Okay, good, good, right. yeah. Take care. Hey, Melinda, you're muted. When is the next one? Uh, I've uh, sent out a uh, list of events with uh, the uh, links on there. So okay. one is, on October 22. Mm -hmm. So it's monthly? Uh, yeah, and then November 19, because the uh, next Thursday would be uh, overeating day. Otherwise, no. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Hi, Sonia. Hi, how are you? I appreciate it. How are you? you? I am well, thank you. It was very, very informative. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to share with you is that anyone who have traveled the world, anyone who have been to a museum, anyone who have looked at art, and anyone who have studied the constellation, much less the seasons of the year, should know that during that period of time, the land mass was all together. Um, if um, and we know this because of earthquakes. Earthquakes have a tendency to divide a land and also it impacts the migration of people. So I am not really surprised of much of the history that I have learned that came out of Africa. And yes, we are the human race, but unfortunately some people did this and also wrote books to make all of this history being hidden that black people can think for themselves. Um, from, from, a, from a girl, from a child growing up. My mother and my father always told me that I was, I was born and I was sprung from the loins of civilization and um, from kings and queens. And um, I always instilled that in my children. And I think we as people need to get the history straight. And I also, I was telling my husband that the history book needs to be rewritten because if people knew where they came from, they would know exactly where they're going. And I appreciate you adding my name to your, my email to your list because I find these lectures to be not only informative, but it's enriching to me as a black woman. And, um, that's what I have to say to share with each and every one of you. Um, it, it, it was fantastic. I know I got emails and I get emails from so many people. I get emails from people who, who think like me and, um, and I, it, it, it just uplifts me and it uplifts my soul. So I thank you guys for sharing and I have a blessed evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the others are going to be back in just a second, and maybe we'll hear from them also. Melinda, what's your impression? Oh, I, I really appreciate when we look at our history, because we just take the shortcut and the bad cut and just look at slavery. We start mm -hmm. back to slavery like like that's our history. That's just, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a disaster. That, that was just, that's nothing of our history. And so people, if they don't look at African history, they don't know their own history. I don't care who they are. They don't know their history. They, they're, you're not looking at world history if you leave that out. And so most of the time it's left out. You know, it's a history that if we, if we looked at the whole picture, we would all be better off. 
But, um, you know, I guess, you know, there are reasons for that. There are reasons for greed and ignorance. You know, maybe they, when they say ignorance is bliss, that's where that comes from. But I, I really, it was very interesting. I think that one thing that I thought about differently was the opposites. Um, sure. You know, although we use that mechanism, I know with this pandemic, I have not only been opposites, but I've been on every aspect of the spectrum of emotion, um, all in the same one day, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, just going, trying to keep a balance but being affected in a positive and a negative and a, you know, in a, in just a, a flat line. I mean, I've been in every emotion, but when you look at the opposites, I think that was interesting to me because you look at, you can't have happy without sad. Mm -hmm. So you could appreciate, you know, some of the emotions that we might consider negative. Um, normally um because we couldn't be happy if we didn't have it so that was interesting but a lot of it you know i have studied and i've ha had to go out of my way to study our history um because it wasn't taught in the schools and i've had some scholars that i you know that were my mentors as well so I just appreciate it, just like the Black Studies group with the AACS, you know, before I even lived here, when I visited, I would find out where they were meeting before we even had a meeting place. We were meeting from house to house in Palm Coast with the AACS. And I would really recommend members or people that aren't members, if you wanna be members, you don't have to be a member, to participate once we are meeting again while with the Black Studies group because you get this all the time, you know, and, and uh, I'm sure you probably have something to contribute yourself so that you might lead one of the sessions. I'm not, I haven't been in a while and they changed it to the Pan-African Studies or whatever they want to call it. Um, but I know that's what we did in the past. And Ryan Ho, you could probably tell us better. Well, I would rely on uh, Rob <laughs> more than me. Well, I'm saying if that's what they're still doing, but I yes. would. They you know, are. That, yeah, okay, good. So. Yeah, yeah they're, they're still meeting, um, um, I think it's once every, uh, once a month on, on Wednesdays or Thursdays. Um, Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday. That's it's Tuesday, and um, it's a wealth of information that comes out of those out of those sessions. Um, but Ryan Ho, do you want to ask the spokesperson what what was the main point that they got out of the uh, discussion? Well, we may have lost some of the spokespersons. Uh, we dwindled down to 23 participants. Okay. Uh, yeah. But maybe we're small enough that anybody who wants to talk, please do. I just have a question and I apologize for missing the best part, but I was curious as to what is the difference between spirituality and religion from the black perspective? Okay, that's a very good question. I'm a, I was going to get into that on a later session, but since you asked, mm -hmm. uh, spirituality is the recognition that, that God is present in every aspect of our existence. Mm -hmm. That's why when you go back to uh, ancient Africa or in Asian cultures or in ancient uh, European cultures, uh, you find that they had a respect for animals, they had a respect for nature and recognizing that that was all part of what we consider God's word. And they understood that since they were made by this divine intelligence that we call God, and I don't think initially people thought of, of this divine intelligence as a man or whatever, it was just a presence. And I'll talk about that later in terms of the, um, the mythology that was developed on the unmoved mover, that everything was here, all of the stuff was here in the word, then this hill comes up and from this heel comes Adam, and then Adam creates certain things. 
but it's this whole presence of the divinity in us. So as a spiritual uh, person or someone who looks at, at, at spirituality, the main thing for a human being is that they understand that the presence of God is within them. And that once they have that understanding, and if they have some principles, such as the principles of my art, that you live by truth, justice, order, righteousness, harmony, reciprocity, morality, mm -hmm. then they can self-correct. Uh, we will never be uh, God, but we strive every day to be uh, a God-like. And sometimes that we stumble, but when we stumble, we know it. And then we go back within ourselves and we try to make sure that we don't uh, display that behavior or not do something that would be perceived as negative by other human beings. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I was reared in a very religious um, household. My mother was very religious. And of course, like most children, I went to church but once I started matriculating through life, I, religion didn't work that well for me um, because I was having all kinds of challenges. And once I started reading and understanding that I could go into myself and change myself if I observed it without judgment. In other words, if there was a habit that I displayed if I just observed that habit without judging it, it would eventually disappear. And so I was able to grow by going inside of myself and really taking a look at myself. And it was painful because I had to look at everything and to come to grips with the reality of me as a human being and then go inside of myself and, and try to change those things that would prohibit me from achieving my goals. And I think that once I was able to do that, then I was very, very fortunate in life. I achieved every goal I set for myself in life. Okay? But that was because of going inside myself. And so, that, so, and so religion is more of, a, of some doctrines that, were, that have been put together by man. And basically, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the, uh, uh, the Bible, or any other holy books, and they are rules and guidelines in order for you to participate in that religion, you have to adhere to. And oftentimes religion causes separation because say for example, if you're a Christian, then you're taught that if you are, don't believe in Jesus, then you can't ever see paradise or live forever, okay? And the Quran states that if you're not a Muslim, then you're infidel. Hmm. So, 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 you know what I mean? So it's like, and, and now I'm, I'm not knocking this. I'm saying people can believe what they want to believe. But, I, but oftentimes religions are man-made and then you have to abide by the rules to be a part of that particular religion. And so it kind of boxes you in. Whereas when spirituality, you're free. Because it's up to you through the study and the understanding of God's word, which is everything that we see. And when you look at the spiritual component of life, that divine intelligence that we call God put his word here for everybody. So no matter where you are on the planet, you can experience and see God's word but it's not easy because you have to figure it out. You have to understand, okay? And that's what happens, say, for people who are living the Eskimos. Once they started understanding and figuring out God's word, they, are, they can live in that cold weather, okay? But in order for them to do that, they had to basically align themselves and understand nature, not fight it, but uh, welcome it and honor it and they were able to come up with ways to survive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Oh. Right, 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 right. Oh, sorry, I can't do it. Okay, I'm sorry.
I wanted to know how you wanted me to handle the questions uh, or what the plan was for those. Well, I think people are asking him now, so. Okay. Okay. Any, any other questions? Oh, they don't, oh, oh, Harry has. Okay. I have a question. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Oh, I was wondering, um, I understand that Dr. Leakey in what is now Tanzania discovered what the, what the first human beings, the uh, remains of the first human beings, and yet you mentioned it was South Africa. Yes. And, and, and that's basically uh, what he discovered in terms of the early remains down in that part of the, of, of the continent. And um, Leakey, uh, once he found out that humans did arise in Africa, I mean, there was a lot of blowback. I mean, even today, I mean, we still have um, what I would consider this tug of war. And we're seeing it here in America right now as we speak. Science versus uh, uh, belief or <laughs> politics or whatever. And so we got to understand that, you know, what we're seeing is very dangerous because when you look at uh, Europe, you know, from, from about 500 AD on up, the church, because of the threat of mathematics and Galileo and those guys starting to find out that, oh, that everything in the Bible is not true because the sun doesn't circle around uh, the earth. Okay, it's the other way around, right. but it states that in the Bible. And so the church started putting, locking those guys up and trying to suppress that. And so as a result of that, they stamped out mathematics and, 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 and um, books, et cetera. And that's why when the library of Alexandria was burned and destroyed, it was probably one of the greatest tragedies in the, in the history of, the, of, of man because hundreds of thousands of books of ancient books that go back 100,000 years of knowledge that was accumulated by man was destroyed. So we almost had to start from, from ground zero again, okay? And you know what happened during the dark, the, during the dark ages. And so, and the way they came out of that was they had to embrace science again. And we had the Renaissance. Once it embraced science, then Europe started moving forward again. All right, and here we are in America about to go back to what caused the dark ages in Europe. Okay, because we, are, we, are, we don't, we, our political leaders are saying, don't trust science. Science isn't true, just trust what I say, even though it doesn't make any sense. So we, we, so we had a dangerous point in, 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 in the history of this country. Yeah. Okay, I can, okay, Harriet is showing me some questions here. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, have I studied in Tanzania or Kenya? No, um, but I, I, I have been to Ghana, I've been to Morocco, and of course I've been to uh, Egypt. I, I, have, I have read a lot about those uh, parts of, of the world and how once the invasion started in Kemet, once the um, uh, Asiatics, they called them, started invading uh, Egypt. And once the Assyrians, which was the last uh, uh, rulership that was uh, 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 in, in Kemet by black people, once they were conquered by the Assyrians, then you had the Persians and it was the Greeks and on and on and on, that a lot of the Africans left. In fact, when we were in Ghana, and this was something that I didn't know, uh, with the Ashanti, we had a guide and he told us that his family had passed down to him that they had come from uh, a Kemet, that they had, to, they had to leave Kemet because of the turmoil and that they came to the um, uh, west coast of Africa. And then I ran into another person from Ghana who said the same thing, okay? So um, uh, all, all of this, and that's why some of the things that we've seen like in Mozambique, where we have the Great Wall of Mozambique, which, which, by the way, is larger than the wall in China. Okay? But I don't think that's publicized. 
it, it's destroyed now. It was destroyed, but it was larger than the wall in uh, Wall of China. Okay, the next question. Oh, can you spell Tekken? Oh, oh, she's gone. Oh, what does right in the skies mean? Oh, okay, that, that's a good one. Um, right in the skies means that, let me give Bye -bye. you an example that all of you can uh, um, uh, relate to. What happened when the, when the Africans came up with the concept of the zodiac, now they're looking at the patterns of certain stars, they were able to say, well, this star looks like some, reminds me of a lion. Uh, uh, this one reminds me of a, a water barrier. Uh, this one reminds me of a, of a man with a belt, like the constellation of Orion. Okay. Oh, that looks like a lion. That reminds me of a lion. So they started mapping them out. Okay. And they started creating stories based on the movement of these heavenly bodies. And one of these stories, and I'm jumping ahead of myself so you guys will get a first taste of this was the story of the constellation of Orion. They called the three belts in the constellation of Orion the three wise men. And Sirius, which is the brightest star in the heaven, which rises in the east. And around December the 21st, okay, we have the winter solstice, which means that the days, the length of the days doesn't necessarily change. It kind of gets, that, that's one of the uh, shortest days of the year. And on the 25th, the days start getting longer. So the ancient people attach, oh, that's the birth of the sun. Okay. And what they also saw was that at that time, the three belts in Orion point directly at Sirius, which is the brightest star in the heavens and is in the east. Okay, so we hear it in the terms of the three wise men and the star in the east. But that's uh, an example of a story that is in the skies. And once you understand it, you can go out there in December every year and you can see it for yourself. It, it can't be destroyed once you understand the mythology. And that's an example. Okay. Okay. And excellent, excellent. Okay. I, 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 okay. I, I have a question. Okay. I wonder if. Yes. I wonder if you might expand on the statement that uh, this is a quote. Our universe is part of a greater whole. Yes, absolutely. Um, wh what I meant by that was that the, the, the universe is, what we see is a manifestation of that divine intelligence that we call God. But what we don't see is what the uh, universe actually came from and all of the ingredients that went into place to create the universe or the Big Bang. So it's a part of this, it's a part of the whole, but it's not the whole totality of existence. Because when we look at uh, the, uh, what they, what the Africans call the noon, it was this liquid or whatever that had, that's been here forever. There's no, there's no beginning and no end. Okay. And because the divine intelligence thought up came this hill, which was the first aspect of something that was material. Okay. And out of that came everything else, the sky, the, the, you know, the wind, et cetera. So we are just, in this universe, that what we see, we're just part of something that we can't see. But we know it's there because, because the whole universe came from it. Okay? We call it God or whatever we want to call it. 
In Chinese okay. mythology, it's called the void. Yes. Everything okay. comes from the void and goes back to the void. <laughs> yes. Can, Absolutely. Can, can you say, um, so we, you talked a little bit about how the uh, science emerged, or the concept of science emerged from the observation of nature. And, and, you know, what you just described as, as did you call it the loom? L-O-O-M? Oh, 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 no, noom. In New York. Okay. So what you, what, what you called, um, the, the, so the Hindu, ancient Hindus have the, the, the same concept. I mean, yes. it's, right? It's the same thing, it's, right? It's the same thing. But, but right. But sure. I try, when I when I, I had a, a, a world religions class and I was trying to explain, you know, they had concepts that reflect um, uh, um, science. Um, what's the physics? The um, um, quantum physics. Yes. And I said, oh, yeah. you know, yes. How could how could they have you know there was there had to be have been some kind of in, an intuition about that right but w do you think that they were keen enough observers of nature to have have somehow intuited that without like all the sophisticated uh, like science and equipment that we have to to know I mean to have some a, a little bit more um, fuller idea of what that is absolutely. Everything is energy. I mean, that's what quantum physics basically says. I mean, it's like, and Einstein proved that, you know, uh, in terms of his theory. Um, and that's what quantum physics uh, basically denotes it has proven. Absolutely, because we got to think. Now, that's why I focused on the timeline. They were here for hundreds of thousands of years, and they were able to uh, decipher these cycles. They were able to see certain things that we can't even imagine. They began to understand things that we can't imagine. And we have to keep in mind that every breakthrough that we have in science is a result of us understanding nature better. You know, advanced mathematics is just a better understanding of nature. Anything that we do when there's a breakthrough in science is because we began to understand nature better. Once we began to understand the human body better, we began to understand DNA, then we were able to trace back all the way to the origins of, of humanity. That's why we know this, because of our understanding of science. So, um, you know, that's why some of the ancients attributed the universe, and that's why they have such respect for animals, they only kill when they had to eat, they never killed an animal just to be killing it because there was just, because that animal was part of God's word. Okay. Native Americans, for example, they would never kill anything unless they were using it for their survival. And that was, and then they prayed and basically had certain rituals after they killed that particular animal because they understood that, that relationship. And that's something that we've lost because we're going out killing animals just for sport to hang something on the wall. Okay. I think some of the reverence for animals killed was because of mystery. Where did it come from? We wanted to come back, so we revere it. Yes. Some Japanese culture did that. Absolutely, because we understand every, there's a cycle. And, and that's why, you know, in terms of a resurrecting or a resurrection or life after death, they un they understood that and they from their perspective it was something that was real but for humans they you had to live by a set of principles which i'm going to talk about the principles of my art this truth justice order and righteousness and that you were expected when you were judged that your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds it had nothing whether you believe in muhammad or any of these other gods that we that we have come up with is whether or not you live your life in accordance with these rules. And so when you when you when your physical body died, your your spirit left, that energy left. And I think Einstein proved that, and quantum physics proved that. Uh, uh, Kathy is talking about that. Your this is nothing but energy. Our bodies, and so when our bodies uh, decay or die. The energy leaves our body, and we know that because um, they have done studies of when people are about to die, 
But then once and after they die, their body is lighter. Something has something has happened. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're energy and, and, and we are spirit. And that's why, especially in Kemet, um, they really believe that they would live after they die if in accordance with those with these principles. But see, what has happened with us is that it's very easy for us to get to heaven. All we have to do is believe in Muhammad or believe in, in maybe Jesus or some other God. And no matter how bad we are, because we're expected to be bad, but as long as we believe, we can still make it to heaven. So we can live and do horrible things. And in our culture, we can still make it to heaven. And it wasn't that way initially. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's now getting close to nine o'clock. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, uh, your attention and your participation. Remember on Thursday, October 22nd at 7 p.m., Rob will be talking about metaphysics and principles of Ma'at. And I hope you'll all join us again for that. Thank you very much and good night. Thank good you. Night. Good, night. Good, night. good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. And thank you, Mr. Wyden. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate it. You have that. a book. You have, have you written?